Let me ask a question then about the sort of social implication question. I I'm sympathetic to the argument, and I'm, I'm not sure how one can gain say the argument that one doesn't want to foreclose avenues of inquiry that could yield scientific truth just because one might not like the consequences. On the other hand, you could imagine an argument that said that when you are proposing a hypothesis with a lot of moving parts, um, with a lot of ifs, as you said, um, notwithstanding that it's falsifiable, um, the standard for publishing it, let's say, um, ought to be higher, this is just a, a hypothesis, ought to be higher when the potential consequences of people mistakenly believing something that turns out to be false are also very high. Mm -hmm. This would be sort of a sliding scale model. If you have a really dangerous idea, you need to have a higher standard of proof before you can publish it than if you have an idea that's just a little bit dangerous. Um, I wonder if you would just react to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a reasonable principle. Um, although, um, it's kind of, it, can, it can work both ways, that if uh, something has to be, uh, if something is interesting enough and uh, both intellectually and, and in its possible positive consequences, and indeed has enough of support that it has to be taken seriously, it's only if it gets out there that everyone can know to shoot it down empirically. Uh, if it's suppressed at the referee stage, then how will you know if it ever manages to make it through the crucible of empirical falsification? Mm -hmm. uh, but which is not, not to deny that, that it's a valid principle in general. I think in this case, because uh, whether or not they're mistaken, and they, they very well might be, um, I, they, it's an unusual paper in the um, number of different kinds of evidence they bring to bear, the amount of homework they did simply in Jewish history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, I think, an impressive piece of work. That isn't to say that it's, it'll necessarily be shown to be correct. It may not be. Great. Well, I'm prepared to open it up a little bit. I'm sure there will be lots of hands. I will try as best as I can to point to uh, the specific, uh, specific questioners. Uh, as a sociology professor at different schools at uh, CUNY uh, for the past 16 years, I've all, and I do teach mostly minorities, and um, every single time that I have a Jewish student, which is very rare in the colleges that I teach at, uh, that uh, student is invariably the top of the class. It practically, you know, because they, they are so infrequent, and when it does happen, that seems to be happening. However, what I wanted to ask you is you seem to discount environment. And when I try to figure out why the Jewish students are, you know, seem to be always the best, um, as well as genetic, I think about the different cultures the different cultural background that the Jews all come from, the emphasis on learning and reading and uh, in general the intellectual life, as opposed to many of these minorities who come from uh, cultures which were primarily agricultural, less of an emphasis on a, a formal learning. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was wondering why you seem not to give any, you know, too much uh, input at all to the, we're always talking about nature versus nurture in sociology as far as any traits that we discuss. So I was wondering why you didn't think that maybe the tradition that Jews have of always stressing the intellect and always stressing learning uh, is important. Yeah, a couple of things. It's certainly true that um, there may be, in fact, there's evidence that the explanations for the uh, lower end of the scale is different for the upper end of the scale. And certainly for the lower end of the scale, environment has an enormous amount to do with it. There are some recent data showing that, that uh, um, uh, intelligence shows less heritability in uh, the, the lower ranges than in the higher ranges. So there are a lot of ways, uh, such as coming from a, a culture, an illiterate culture, most extremely, where you would certainly express, expect a depression uh, of intellect. Although that's, um, I think, uh, doesn't imply that when you push, try to push towards the higher ranges, that uh, it would be that easy for environmental manipulations uh, to do that. It can certainly make you worse. It's not clear how much better that it can make you above a certain threshold. That having been said, I should also emphasize that the data that we have 
suggests that family environment uh, is uh, not a cause of intelligence, although it leaves open the possibility that cultural environment is a cause, simply because the studies of genetic variation are generally done within a given culture. And studies comparing cultures, we don't have evidence uh, of. And so it, it indeed is possible that, that uh, it could be responsible for the difference. As for the, the Jewish love of learning, again, that's um, uh, just as I think one demands a certain burden of proof for any genetic explanation. One would want a certain burden of proof for a particular environmental explanation. And the anecdotes that I mentioned from Bloch, Chomsky, and Schachter uh, cast some doubt on the idea that it's intellectual achievement or indeed the particular areas in which Jews do achieve that was necessarily what was encouraged in Jewish culture. Maybe it was, but again, I would, you'd, you'd want some data for that just as you'd want data for the genetic hypothesis. I, I would, if I could just jump in there for just one second. I, those were interesting anecdotes, um, notwithstanding that I think Chomsky's mother's comment might be reinterpreted in light of the fact that Chomsky's father was a kind of a linguist. Yeah. Um, so, but... It's <laughs> but, um, but it strikes me that in those cases, it might be that they were being told, don't engage in abstract intellectual pursuits, engage in intellectual pursuits of practical import that will lead to uh, better earning power including the father who wanted his son to be Stanley Schachter's father, wanted him to become a law, you know, enter the laundry business. Presumably it was because he thought he could make more money in that business. And under the, the hypothesis they, as they present it, wanting to make money would seem to be the thing that one ought to be focused on for selecting for intelligence under the model that they're, they're describing. So I'm not sure that the anecdotes yes. necessarily <laughs> show just, just what you suggested that they, that they showed in that, in that way. No, that, that's certainly a, a fair point. And uh, so the question is, and indeed that is... Part of the um, CHH hypothesis is that exactly that pressure, that is to translate smarts into economic success, was in place for a long time, uh, but that it didn't stop at culture and the, that it left its imprint. Uh, that cultural practice let, let, left it a statistical imprint on the, on the genome. So it's almost necessary that that ha have happened, and the question is whether it uh, had any effects on the genome or simply was carried over in a cultural chain that, that it's in. Yeah. Um, a little bit further back, just uh, in the striped uh, shirt. Yes, please. I don't know uh, whether this was a theory, uh, excuse me, hypothesis one or two on CHH. Um, I have a family member who uh, um, died, a um, young person died, it wasn't Tay-Sachs, but uh, another genetic disease, uh, and they uh, adopted, uh, predictably, a girl from China. So my question uh, is, are you aware of any sort of studies where um, you know, time studies where effects on IQ are determined? Um, see, for the first question, I, I, I don't know if I uh, quite got, are there any studies of, of I, I did get the question. Long-term effects of adoption? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the um, effects of adoption, there are effects of adoption on the IQs of children while they're living in the house, and they peter out by adulthood. So there are virtually no effects of uh, adoption once the child is uh, once the, the child is in, in is uh, in his or her twenties. I just wanted to uh, turn for, for two seconds to those uh, three anecdotes that that you told and suggest that those gentlemen, Chomsky in particular, might have wanted to self-present uh, uh, as you know counter to uh, Jewish tradition and Jewish myth, so that uh, in other words, yeah. they're presenting themselves as maverick. Uh, in some ways, because it would be easy to cite numerous instances of the opposite. Yes, no, there are certainly anecdotes in the other direction, although this, this one came actually from, uh, an, from an interview with, um, it was reported, I believe, by Chomsky's wife in a conversation that, he had, that she had with, uh, with Chomsky's mother. Ned Block, um, he may even be here, uh, I, I'm sure it isn't. I, I, I completely believe the anecdote, and likewise with, uh, with Stanley Schachter. But it, they are just anecdotes. Uh, I don't know of any study of what percentage of Jewish families encouraged achievement in the areas in which Jews do achieve versus some much less ambitious success in the family laundry business. Um, and I, I, I personally know Jewish families that did completely discourage their children from going on to college, let alone graduate school, uh, or beyond. Uh, was the um, suggestion in the study that the difference in intelligence is due to the effects of those particular genes that are also associated with disease, um, or 
like if you took out all of the Jews who have those genes, would you end up with a, a population that's similar mm -hmm. in intelligence to the rest of the world? Or is the suggestion that um, that those genes were selected for is evidence that intelligence was selected for? Yes, I think the claim is that, um, that those uh, that those are, are just some of the genes that were selected for. We see them because people with them tend to show up in clinics with, with uh, these terrible diseases. But that if there was selection for intelligence in general, it would select both ones that had only positive effects and positive and negative, uh, positive effects with negative byproducts, as long as on average the positive outweighed the negative. Uh, but we have a, uh, an ascertainment bias for the ones that also have negative effects because those are the ones we see first, although they we see because of their disease effects. Although they do, by some estimates, if you look at all of these, the um, deleterious recessives, uh, an alarmingly high proportion of Ashkenazi Jews have at least one of them. Uh, maybe this is the source of Jewish hypochondria. Uh, but some, uh, on the order of, I forget the figure, but it may have been like more than 50% have at least one of these recessives. Uh, because 59%. you did, oh, yeah. sorry, because you did say at the end that um, if you're trying to make designer babies with intelligence, you'd end up with ones with no. disease. Is that? No, you're right. That, that it could be that there are other genes that have nothing but positive effects. They'll be harder to find, uh, but that that certainly is possible. So this doesn't rule out the possibility of genetic enhancement. Although, given that probably most genes have more than one effect. Um, it, it raises a, a danger flag. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Uh, are you saying that the reason we see a correlation between the genes for IQ and these deleterious genes for rare diseases um, peculiar to Ashkenazim is the old story of, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the, for, the, uh, for the lost wallet under the light uh, fixture because there's light here. Uh, is that the reason why we see that? Uh, or is there some other scientific explanation for a correlation between the genes for intelligence and the genes for these deleterious diseases? Well, yeah, the, um, uh, it should be emphasized that the, that particular correlation uh, has been shown only in the case of Gaucher's disease and is really hypothesized for the others, has not been shown yet. But if it did exist, um, I think the idea, well, I think it's looking for your keys under the lamppost in, in a good way in which geneticists always do, namely you look at the um, parts of the genome that have been where you have reason to believe something interesting is going on because of the diseases they cause. An enormous number of genes whose function that we know are named after the diseases they cause when they're broken. Uh, and so that's just been the method of, of an awful lot of uh, human genetics, simply because you can't do experimental manipulations the way you can with other organisms where you can transfect uh, a, an organism with a particular gene using a virus. We're kind of stuck with the, with, with the uh, mutations that happen in nature, and so a major route for finding any genes has been look to find people who's, for whom the gene is broken, and that's what, what it's typically named after. We have time for perhaps two or three more questions. Uh, yes, ma'am, sitting in the back. I think, I think it behooves us. I think it behooves us at some point to um, to develop a reason for all this research, other than the fact that it's very nice to hear about how smart we are. We have to try to find a way in which we can incorporate the data that we have, the, re the research, the conclusions, into something that helps a society in which there are significant differences. It seems to me the main thing it's done is justify and accept the reality of differences beyond the traditional psych psychology industry's notion of everything being uh, environmentally done. Uh, there are differences. Jews, for example, became money lenders and whatever they did in the period in that period because they could, because there were certain gifts that require a money lender have, counting, numerability, et cetera, et cetera. We have to extend that to the variety of things that the world is, the challenges that the world is presently making. Do you want to say something? You don't have to. Yeah. Next. Uh, yes. Uh, in the far, very far back. Certainly, yes. This will be, this will be, why don't we make this our last question? I was just wondering about the cloud, whether or not this is valid. 
whether or not a lot of the discussion, sorry, I didn't mean to make you run. <laughs> the discussion about whether or not this is valid hinders in part on, you know, what constitutes uh, the genes for intelligence. And, you know, this, the whole idea of the sphingolipid uh, function is all new to me, but I was just wondering what other than that, you know, is the, sort of the current state of research on how, you know, genes make us more or less intelligent. Yeah. There's some good books on that that I can recommend. <laughs> well, there's, there's actually a, a, a rather large gap in our understanding. From studies of massive numbers of genes, namely twin and adoption studies, where you look at half of a genome or sharing a, a genome versus not sharing it, I think there's a very high probability that there are genes whose effect is to enhance intelligence. No one has found any. Uh, and uh, that is, if you mix up, look at the DNA of a lot of people with very high IQs and compare them to people with not so high IQs. So far, there have been a couple of claims that have then been retracted, but, um, but uh, there's not to my knowledge, this may have changed recently, uh, been identification of a single gene that affects IQ. What this could mean is that there are several hundred of them, uh, each one of which has a very small effect and hence is below the um, sensitivity of our current methods to uh, detect. An exception might be if the uh, torsion dystonia gene uh, has the traits claimed of it, it could be that that is an I I gene that boosts IQ by a lot. One gene, 10 points. Of course, it also has this uh, horrible side effect. I expect that as the techniques become better advanced, there will be discovery of a probably a large number of genes, each of which has a very small effect. I bet that that's going to be the, uh, that, that's the expectation of most researchers in um, the, the behavioral genetics of intelligence. May I thank all of you for coming, and let's all jointly thank Professor